You are tuned in to another edition of Americana Music Profiles, brought to you by Americana Rhythm Music Magazine and AmericanaMusicMagazine.com. I'm your host, Greg Tutwiler. Let's jump right in to the next exciting interview. Mark Wayne Glassmeyer was just 10 years old when his parents gave him his first guitar for Christmas. That self-proclaimed shy kid from Bethlehem, Pennsylvania, turned his childhood dreams of being a rock star into a professional career of writing and recording music. On this edition of Americana Music Profiles, we talk about his life in music and his latest CD, Can't Be Denied. Hi, Mark. Welcome to the podcast this afternoon. Hi, Greg. It's nice to be here. Yeah, good to have you. Good to get a chance to to chat. Uh, You are in uh, Texas, right? I am. I am uh, actually in uh, Arlington, Texas. Okay. All right. Cool. Um, right in between Dallas and Fort Worth. For yeah. People that don't know where it is. Yeah. yeah. Right in between. Is that is that uh, where you grew up, or is that just where you ended up? No, that's <laughs> that's where I ended up. Yeah, I um, I'm originally from uh, Pennsylvania, born and raised in uh, okay. Eastern Pennsylvania. All right. A little steel town called Bethlehem. Yeah. So. And uh, <clears throat> I, I think I read where you. Uh, Kind of get started early with your uh, uh, music and uh, a Christmas present, I believe, right? That's exactly right. Yeah, I got a Christmas. I got a guitar for a Christmas present when I was, uh, uh, I think, around ten years old, ten, eleven years old, something like that. And uh, I was uh, wanted to be a rock star. In the, you know, like <laughs> every young boy, right? <laughs> uh, exactly. Exactly. Yeah. So I've, I've been been playing quite a while. So, uh, give us a little bit of the story. How, how did you get from uh, guitar for Christmas to where you are today? Wow, that's a long story. <laughs> <laughs> no, but uh, I'll, I'll, I'll give you the Reader's Digest yeah, version. Yeah. Um, yeah. Well, you know, I, I grew up, uh, I'm, a, I'm a child of the 60s, so I grew up uh, listening to uh, where I lived, you know, on the East Coast, was, I, you know, I didn't have a whole lot of exposure to certainly not country music as it is today because they're the country music today was really more like you know folk rock right when i grew right. up and then that's kind of what i was uh that's kind of what i cut my teeth on growing up and listening to pretty much primarily singer songwriters you know the uh james taylor's and the cat stevens and people like that and they had simon and garfunkel and loved the harmonies and of course then crosby stills and nash and i i uh took on the guitar at a pretty young age and uh, never really took it seriously. You know, you know kind of like every kid that gets a new toy, it's great for the first couple of months and then it kind of collects dust in a closet or under right. the bed. And that's kind of what happened with me. I, I took, a, uh, my parents um, uh, provided me with guitar lessons for a couple of months and when they realized I wasn't, I wasn't practicing, you know, practicing the scales and yeah. practicing the things they, they wanted me to do, I, I ended up losing interest, and they said, well, heck with this. We're not going to waste our money. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, so I put it away for a while and then picked it back up again. And the good news was out of the out of the, uh, out of of the lessons I had, I learned, you know, four or five basic chords. Right. And as I grew older, I took the guitar back up again and fiddled around with it. And once I got to high school and college, I started to take it more seriously again, got into college, and was really cool, you know. It was really cool. Chicks love guys with guitars. You know? <laughs> right. So it was. Uh, plus, it was. I was a pretty shy kid too. I was. Most people. I was. I was an athlete. I played sports, football, and wrestling, and went to college for wrestling, as a matter of fact. But I, um, I uh, was very shy, and uh, my guitar was my outlet. Sure. And I would, uh, in fact, I literally would sit in the sit in the men's bathroom in the in the uh, dorm I was in because it really echoed. It had great sound in there, and I'd uh-huh. play my guitar in there, and it sounded much better than I was. Uh, but anyway, one thing led to another. Uh, I started playing small clubs, coffee houses, and that's eventually how I paid the rest of my way through college was playing in cl- any place it would have me. Yeah, wow. And that, that led me to, on the East, being on the East Coast, that led me to playing um, – I only lived an hour and a half from New York City, and of course there was a big folk scene up there. And uh, so I started taking a bus to New York City uh, at least once a week. A buddy of mine and I, another guy, he tech- technically he was a he was a peer of mine, but we were both solo acts in in our town of Bethlehem, PA. 
And uh, so we said, well, let's go up there together because we were both kind of at the same level. Mm-hmm. And let's, we were both kind of nervous and shy and stuff. So we would take the bus up to New York and <laughs> play up there at the open mics. The very first night we went, and this was then, this was now in the 80s. And the very first night we went, uh, we went to a place called Folk City, which was the mecca of folk music. Uh, back in the 60s and the 70s, everybody, Dylan got a start there, and everybody mm. who was anybody played at Folk City. And lots of country artists, too, uh, Towns Van Zandt, and right, all these yeah. guys, that, that they all played there. And anyway, so so we went in there to play the open mic, and we got there, and you had to pull a number, and I was like number 72, and he was number 73, and of course we took the bus in, so we're waiting around, waiting around, it was like 2 o'clock in the morning till we finally got up to play each individually i got up literally it was the it was the host her, and her name was sunny oaks who was the sister of the, the late great phil oaks mm-hmm. the big mm-hmm. uh, folk icon and she was there she was the host and then there was the sound guy and the bartender and a couple of drunk people, <laughs> some of the drunk people that was there we were we'd already missed our bus back so we just stayed there all night and played and it led to other gigs huh. and Eventually, it, it, we we eventually we ended up teaming up being a duo, and one thing led to another, and uh, played there for three nights a week for years in the in the village, which was a big thing for us in New York City. And, sure, uh, yeah, wow. But that led to somebody hearing us, actually hearing me, and it led to going to Nashville to doing some demos, and uh, one thing led to another. Demo ends up getting in the hands of somebody from Warner Brothers and they encouraged me to come to Nashville. So I did some more demos down there. And before you know it, I moved to Nashville mm-hmm. and, uh, which was a very big step. This was now in like 1995. I started going to Nashville. I was a member of Nashville songwriters association, which was a, right. was a really good organization for songwriters. And, uh, anyway, one thing led to another ended up moving to Nashville was there for 10 years. And, um, went through a really nasty divorce and it made a lot of sense. I had to, I had to move out of there anyway. So I, well, I'm going to move to Texas because I had some connections down in Texas. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. That's how I ended up here. Yeah. <laughs> so now wow. I'm I, I, but, yeah. It's a long journey. <laughs> it, yeah. It, yeah. It, 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 when you, uh, kind of began picking the car, the, the guitar back up more seriously, um, was there ever a thought, uh, Hey, you know what? Maybe I could do this professionally full time, I kind of see this path ahead of me now kind of thing, or or was it always kind of just being at the right place at the right time? You know, it's probably a combination. I mean, deep down inside, that's what I wanted to do. I wanted to uh, really, I really wanted to be, to do it full time as a profession. Uh-huh. But in, in all honesty, being totally transparent, I mean, I probably wasn't confident enough to, other people told me I was good enough, yeah. but I wasn't sure I believed it myself, you know? So I always had a job. I always worked, uh, even during all that time, even when I was making trips back and forth to New York, I had a full-time job working construction. Uh, my parents had a, con- my dad was a contractor, so I worked, I worked construction days, and then I'd jump in the car and, well, eventually, first, initially I took a bus, but eventually I started driving in, and I'd get off of work at around 5.30, get cleaned up, drive to New York, play for three or four hours, turn around, drive back, wow. get home around two thirty, three 3 o'clock in the morning, and go to work again at 6 o'clock in the morning. So, wow. But I did that for years. And But, but I, you know, the passion and the desire was sure. there. I mean, yeah. That's really what I wanted to do. And, and you know, it was, it was, I always, I, I, you know, I was, I was never confident enough, at least during those times, to feel like, well, I just need to do this full time. I, I wanted to, but I, you know, I had uh, a wife and three stepkids and was trying to raise the family and keep a roof over their heads. Yeah. And, you know, it's a, it's a tough juggling act. Lots of sure. people go through it. Yeah. It's a tough thing. Way better if you're single. Yeah. <laughs> Way easier in a lot of ways, you know. What, was but there anyway, a, yeah, so. Was there a time during that when you uh, recall feeling that confidence kind of click in? I mean, you're already doing it. And, and, uh, you know, still, you mentioned a couple of minutes ago, feeling like you didn't quite have the, uh, the belief in yourself yet. Do you, do you recall when that happened? Uh, you know, I'll tell you, I, 
I'll tell you what I think when I think it was for me. I was I was down in Nashville. I still live in Pennsylvania, but I was going back and forth to Nashville quite a bit, uh, primarily with the Nashville song doing things with the National Songwriters Association. And I went to the Bluebird. You, you're, you're familiar with the Bluebird, I'm guessing. Yes. Uh-huh. Uh, the Bluebird, Bluebird Cafe is a very famous uh, place in Nashville, and it's kind of the place as a songwriter, singer-songwriter, it's kind of like the place to play. Right. And, um, I mean, short of, you know, one of the big stages, but it's it's a really important place to play. It's C and B C, one of those things. Very intimate, very small. And anyway, I went there with some friends, and I was still really pretty, pretty shy, and I went in there, and probably not, not real confident. But I went in there, and um, there was an open mic, and there was this guy. There was actually the open mic. There was on a Monday night, and you think, well, everybody in Nashville is great. Well, that's mm, not. Right. There's a lot of really great people, but right. there's a lot of people that, you know, probably aren't ready for it. Right. Right. And I went in there thinking, uh, I saw this. I watched this guy, and he was, he was not very good. And he had recently moved there from from some some place far away, and he'd moved to Nashville because he was following his dream. And he got up there, and he was again. He wasn't, he, and, you know, not to be critical of anybody, but he sure. just wasn't ready, and was not very good. And I thought, man, if this guy, if this guy can do it, if this guy has the confidence to yeah. do it. I got to have the confidence yeah, to do it. Yeah, yeah. And, and that really literally led to me uh, moving there. I, mean, I moved there probably the next year, and or maybe even within the next six months. I mean, it was a real short period of time from when yeah. I saw that guy. Yeah. And I, I need to make this commitment. If he can do it, I can do it. Yeah, yeah. And that, kinda, that was kind of the turning point for me. Hmm, that's awesome. Um, I think I read, too, where you, you had an opportunity to um, – uh, you, you mentioned um, – uh, Phil's daughter, uh, but but I think you got to work with him on a PBS show. Is that right? Well, not with him because he, he was already he had he had uh, passed away back in the early seventies, I think. But uh, Phil Oaks, they have a Phil Oaks song night. Okay, he was like legend in the village back in the sixties. He was he was equi- Really, they said he was second only to Bob Dylan, and huh. he was. Uh, the difference was he. I think well. Not to take anything away from Bob Dylan, because Bob Dylan is Bob Dylan, but sure. but um, but he was pretty well respected, and he you know he was uh, he started, but that again this was the '60s, and he became very politically active, and uh, he was by today's standards it would be considered mild, but at the time he was very outspoken and kind of took a different path. Okay. But at any rate, he's still very well revered, and they have a I don't know if they still do it, but I know that they did. They had been doing it, certainly when I was there, they would have every year. In fact, it's around this time of the year, it's like October, November, they have a Phil Oak song night. And all the old folkies, like Dave Van Rock would play there, and uh, Tom Paxton, and Melanie, and Joni Mitchell showed up one night, and uh, hmm. all these folk legends uh, would come out, and they'd do Phil Oak songs. And I was part of, I was part of that, uh, actually on a couple of occasions where was filmed on PBS and okay. it, was a, it was really quite an experience. Yeah. 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 That's neat. Was that uh, pre or post Nashville? That was pre. Yeah. That was pre. Okay. Okay. Yep. Pre Nashville. And when, and I think I also read that, that songwriting is, is kind of been a, a, a pretty uh, significant piece of this for you too. Is that right? It is. Yeah, it has been. Um, you know, that's another thing. I really didn't start writing seriously until probably probably around when I started going to New York, which was in the which was in the mid eighties. Okay, and uh, that's when I really and again being around up there, being around other writers like that's really it was truly my first exposure, other than the radio, mm-hmm. you know, to hearing people do songs that they wrote themselves. And um, so it was, for me, it was it was kind of like a, an eye opening period and I started to become you know as he became more confident you know it's not easy no. it's not easy <laughs> to write to you know yeah, you know as, yeah. a, as a writer yourself yeah. as a journalist you know it's it's you're laying everything out on the line and you're sure. you're setting yourself up for uh, for criticism yep. and yep. people making fun of you, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> you, you yeah. name it so it's, it takes some guts to do it yeah. and uh, but you know it took me 
that's another thing. Even recognizing myself as an artist, 